coming in yesterday. Today was not that bad coming into work. So hopefully everyone's doing well and uh, uh, we're excited to be able to at least get together via Zoom uh, this morning. And uh, I'll let uh, Tom introduce our speaker. Tom. Thank you so much, Marshall. So we are so delighted to have uh, Phil Carrazio here with us for Grand Rounds today. Uh, we were delighted when he accepted the invitation. Uh, it was supposed to be in person uh, here, but unfortunately couldn't make it out. Uh, but hopefully everybody is doing well. Uh, so Phil, if folks don't know, is a great leader in urologic oncology, uh, had spent a bunch of time at Hopkins, is now is at University of Pennsylvania, where he is the uh, chief of the section of urology at the Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. Uh, he is an expert in many different forms of cancer and runs a uh, big registry and has his finger in clinical and translational uh, research. More important than that, I think he's what we would consider the whole type of person. He is um, a big advocate for wellness, for mentorship, uh, does podcasting, has a very serious microphone we were just talking about before, and we could be more delighted to have you here. So, Phil, please uh, take it away. Tom, Marshall, thank you so much for inviting me and having me. Um, I don't know if you guys can all see the chat, but I'm going to try and paste in a, um, a poll link. I'll have some live um, polls as we go through the talk, um, and I'll give you time to kind of log into that as well. But I'm going to put up the, the slides, and here we go. So perfect. So when I was talking to Tom and, and Seema, they, they asked me to talk a little bit about mindfulness. And I said, you know, what direction would you guys like to go in? And so we, they, they thought it might be best to talk about how we manage complications and some of the things that don't work out so well in surgery. And uh, so that's where we'll, where we'll start. And so I just like to say, um, I did want to be there in person today very much and be with you all personally, but my grandmother, who is pictured there in the, uh, in the middle, 102 years old and just passed last week. So I'm actually in New York, not in Philadelphia. And we are celebrating her life. And it's one of those amazing dichotomies about death. While sad, um, we get to celebrate her life. We get to bring the family together, which is exactly what she would have wanted. And you could see her there with my two daughters and one of my nieces. And, you know, she's got 10 uh, grandkids running around this hotel right now. So if any of them come busting in behind me, you, uh, you are pre-warned um, why that happens. So thank you for, for allowing me to visit you virtually. So I have no disclosures for this particular talk. I do have a podcast, as Tom mentioned. Uh, many of you um, have listened to it, and, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, there are no financial benefits to that podcast uh, as it currently sits. So why the cemetery talk? Why walking through the cemetery? And um, many of you may have seen this, this quote, and it's by Rene Lariche, who is a, a classic vascular surgeon. It's and every surgeon carries within themselves a small cemetery from time to time, they go to pray. And the second part of this quote, not so many people know, and it's a place of bitterness and regret where they must look for an explanation for their failures. And that's where we're going to get today. That's what we're going to talk about is that cemetery. And that's uh, the title of the talk. But before we get there, um, just like any other academic talk, we have an outline and objective. So we'll talk about why a mindful approach to surgery and surgical training We'll talk about the basics of mindfulness, what that means, and then we'll really get into how we can apply these things into our life as surgeons, specifically talking about complications and, and some bad behaviors. So there's a bunch of reactions when people hear mindfulness and surgery. And so the first thing I'd like to do is take a little bit of a pulse of the room. Uh, the slide looks a little bit off, but let's see if we can uh, get everybody to kind of chime in. We'll give you a couple minutes. You can either use your, your browser or your phone. And it'll take one word at a time. So feel free to put in anything, uh, anything you'd like. Catherine, thanks for putting in the chat there for me. Good. Centered awareness, presence. My slide looks a little off center. Are you guys seeing the whole thing? Dr. Stoller, give me a yes or no if you're seeing the whole yeah. thing. I can. Yeah, looks good. It looks okay to you. Yeah. Tom, Tom gave a head shake. No. Oh, that's a, Oh wait, now now I see it. It's it is a little off. A I'm little off. skewed. All right, I'm going to yeah. stop the share for a second, bring it right back, just to see if that'll reset the uh, reset the. All right. No, it's a little off still. Yeah, we're going to try one more thing. And if it's a little off, then it's a little off. We'll deal a with it. Off. Right, exactly. All 
Yeah, it looks like we're going to be dealing a little bit off today. That's okay. This talk's okay. a little bit off, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll manage. So good. I love what people are putting in. Calm, centering, self-awareness, presence, cautious, knowing. Um, these are all great things. And this is just, once again, taking the pulse of the room a little bit. So one more quote, and this one says, do you use mindfulness in your practice daily, occasionally, no, or D is actually, what does mindfulness have to do with surgery? And let's see if we can. I'm going to continue working on it, see if I can't make it show up a little better. Good. So we've got some believers in the room, some people who, who practice mindfulness, and we've got some skeptics too, which is wonderful. We want to see a good balance. That's what makes us uh, strong. So I'll keep rolling here. Good. So this story started um, for me during COVID, uh, or I would say it came to a head during COVID and all of a sudden had a lot of time to reflect and think about uh, what kind of surgeon I wanted to be, where I came from, and, and where I wanted to go. And long story sh short, mindfulness resonated with me. Uh, the, as a platform, it provided kind of a foundation for the things I was doing good and gave me a, a reason to understand why I was doing well in some areas and where I could improve and where I could get better. And it started me down this whole process of thinking how to move these things forward and how to share this message and story with other people. And honestly, that's where the podcast was born. I needed somewhere to put down thoughts. And I said, well, if this helps one other person by me making an audio record of this, then great. Then I've helped one other person. And it's done a lot more than that. So once again, thanks for, thanks for listening. So this question says, describe the classic surgeon. Who, when you think classic surgeon, who do you think of? What do they look like? What are some of their character traits? Rigid, intense. Hubris, overconfident. Killed, cold, hostile. Dogmatic is one of my favorite words to put here. And there's a lot of great things about the classic surgeons too, but we see a lot of, we see a lot of negatives here and, and that's okay. That's part of this process and part of working through this. Good. Decisive, big. Oops. Perfect. And now I'm going to ask you one more question. Oh, here's the classic surgeon, right? This is the, the Halsteadian surgeon. In this country, older white man, we've, we've come some of the way in changing the way this classic surgeon looks, right? But a lot of those classic principles of, of dogma and harshness and the, the saying it, you know, it didn't matter about their personality or their bedside because they had great technical skills. A lot of that has, has gone out the window in, in our minds. So when we think about it now, let's go the other way. Who's your ideal surgeon? Write down some character traits of that person or who you want to be, empathetic, compassionate, prepared, knowing, humble, I love this, diverse. A leader. Compassion is growing. Skilled. Absolutely, right? This is a technical job. Adaptable. Good. Calm. Perfect. So here are some thoughts, and I'll just ask you to reflect on who you think this describes. Gracious, thoughtful, peaceful, purposeful, self-control with calm, with a focus on service and a focus on transcendence. I think these are great qualities of a surgeon. Unfortunately, these aren't used to describe a surgeon. This is used to describe a, a, a Buddhist monk or the Dalai Lama specifically. But I think these are great qualities of, of a surgeon. And th this is there's something called the paramitas, where the Buddhist qualities of enlightened beings, and if you look through these, these are 
I think a lot of the qualities we want to have as surgeons, generosity, ethical conduct, patience, honesty, effort, concentration, but with wisdom, expertise, goodwill, and serenity. And I just want to point out now, because we're going to get into complications and when things go bad later, perfection is not on this list. We do not need to be perfect. You're not expected to be perfect. And so uh, Buddha also said that we should not practice um, what he taught, unless it worked in the context of their own life or your own life. So I'm going to provide a lot of context today and a lot of ways to think about this. And the hope is that at least something resonates with you and makes you better in the upcoming uh, week and weeks and years as you move forward through your practice. And so we're surgeons, we're scientists. We often think in black and white data, hypotheses, rationale, outcomes. And there are some data here. And there's data from UCSF. Dr. Labaris in, in surgery department has run two randomized trials of cognitive-based or mindfulness-based practices with surgical residents. I don't know if any of you are involved, but there are some objective data here that, that says that mindfulness-based training can help a lot. And interestingly, there's some basic science now backing this up, showing that, that it improved uh, the response to adversity and stress-stimulating pathways, which is kind of interesting and, and really provocative. But I think more so than the objective data, if we look at some of the subjective data, and this was some of the reports and what people said, and what you see here is changed how I think, awareness, purposefulness, and communication, emotion, and I had an established group with which to share these. And so we'll say black and white counts, but if we can change perceptions, if we can change that big gray zone, we're doing something positive too. So we can't play chess unless we know what the chess pieces do. So we're going to start with some definitions of mindfulness, just so we're all on the same page. And it really is about, about paying attention in a sustained and particular way. And there are three components that we need to know. And I'll walk you through some examples for, in surgery for all of those components. They are intention, presence, and being non-judgmental. So intention or living an intentional surgical life, there's two ways I like to think about this. And one is this, this great uh, story. So Joseph Campbell is one of the um, kind of giants in the in the world of mythology. And he said there are three classic human mythologies, or you can break them down into three categories. There's the classic Celtic myth, where the hero's walking through the woods and they find a fairy or a nymph and they take them on a magical, fantastic journey. There's the wartime myth, where you are drafted or pulled into war, and then a hero emerges. Or there's the classic Roman and Greek mythology and this is the one where you set out on a quest and the hero knows exactly what they want to do. And I would argue with you, you could wait for your fairy or your nymph. You could, uh, especially when you're in training, think you're in war. But this is the one we want. We want to be focused on our quest and we want to set that quest out ahead of us uh, and who we want to be. And I love this quote. This is not a idea. We actually have to practice these intentions. We have to put them forward and think about what we are going to do. So we can think of this in two aspects. We have our technical skills as surgeons, and we have our professional development, something uh, I now call the space between technique, between the needle drivers and the sutures and the robot. What are we doing between those techniques? And Malcolm Gladwell brought a lot of this to our attention in the, with the 10,000 hour rule. But if you really get into this data and this literature, it's not just about 10,000 hours, but the key tenets of that are all intention-based defining goals, focusing on improvement, and a plan for reaching the, those goals for a very technical skill set. And if you go back and you want to read the original article by uh, Anders Ericsson, which is a fascinating read, it's way too long of an article, but there's like three pages uh, about the actual violin and piano students that are really cool. Yeah, the 10,000 hour rule was a total extrapolation or estimation of how long it took to get to expert level. But what was really important is that the best students, the elite performers practiced daily to develop automatic habits, and they deliberately rested. They also had the most rest in their afternoons and at night, allowing themselves to recover and focus harder the next day. And so this concept of periodization comes from exercise science, and we all know this. If you want bigger arms, you go to the gym, you pick up a weight, you do bicep curls, you allow that arm to recover, and you do it over again. And the same process can be considered for a variety of skills that we have. But the most important thing that we all forget is that rest is a huge part of this equation. And we often burn ourselves out uh, by working hard and working to the next level. And there's a new concept in, in um, performance physiology that basically says the one rep rule. Instead of pushing yourself to 
absolute fatigue and coming back the next day, give yourself one more rep, stop there, and you'll come back the next day more refreshed, more energized, ready to work harder. And at the end of two months or two years, wherever you want to measure it, you will do a lot better with that one rep mentality than, than working to exhaustion. And the reason this works is we go from what's called system uh, two learning, which is our slow, effortful thought, to system one, which is in intuition and instinct. And anybody who has children or has been around children has seen this happen as they learn how to walk or their alphabet or to count. And this process happens with myelination, and it happens with repeated behaviors. And the actual myelination occurs mostly at night during our sleep processes. So rest is so important to what we do. The other part of intention is our professional development and our purpose, who we are as surgeons. And mindfulness can actually change this in really profound ways. This is a phenomenal book for skeptics who are interested. This book is how the, all the science behind meditation. And one of the most fascinating points is that through mindfulness and meditation practices, you can change your brain morphology, your neural connections, all the way down to your epigenetics and your telomere biology. Uh, allowing for all, permanent altered traits in your DNA through intentional practices, mindful practices on a daily, weekly, or repeated basis. So how do we find out what that intention is as surgeons? Well, we start with values, right? And we can think about this in a number of ways. You can just write down your values. You can think about who your heroes are. I like thinking about how you want to be remembered. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Lao Tzu, he who dies and yet does not perish has longevity. And um, I know Seema knows who this is, and, and many of you may know who this is. This is Chris Wood, who's a giant in our field of urologic oncology and specifically kidney cancer. And we lost Chris way too young. But Chris lived a very intentional life. You knew exactly who Chris was by his values, and he lived them. And anybody who knew Chris knew he was a badass surgeon. And he loved his patients and his trainees and the people around him. That's how he lived his life. Those were his values. And it was very clear uh, in who he was. So we can think about values. We can put them in the context of our life, right? We all have a life in and outside of medicine and the hospital. So we have to put those values in context. We can write them down and identify our priorities. And one of my favorite word games is you can only have one priority. So identify that priority, and then you can rank things underneath that. But once you identify that priority, it makes decision-making easy. For instance, family is my priority. So unfortunately, I didn't get a plane and come to see you guys in person in UCSF. That was an easy decision for me, no, even though I really, really, really wanted to spend time with you in person. Create a mission statement. Write these things down and revisit them. Look at them every once in a while and make sure you're making progress and then cultivate them. And that is the hardest part. So here's my current mission statement to be the best father and husband I can be and to make lasting improvements in urologic cancers. And every once in a while, I'll just throw up quotes here that I think are profound, but you can change uh, and you can become somebody new. You just have to work at it. So how do we develop purpose? How are we present? And I'll tell you, there's no more present place than the operating room. And this was a picture from, from Hopkins before I left. Uh, a fellow, a chief resident, and one of our, our great surgical techs doing a thrombus. And there is nothing more present than the operating room when it's at its best. Everybody's intensely focused on that patient, that problem, and fixing it. So we are mindful. We are present in our everyday practice. And uh, that can expand to a variety of things in surgery, in medicine. And we just have to think about how we apply those, those skills. And one of the biggest questions in Eastern medicine is who am I? But it's not just the East, it's existentialism, it's the West. And in medicine, one of our biggest struggles is often from identity confusion, something called cognitive dissonance, where you think you are someone other than you are. And we've seen these problems. And if you think about most of the struggles you see in the hospital, either someone thinks they're something other than they are, or their department or division or chair thinks there's someone other than they are, or their institution thinks there's someone other than they are. And just a simple explanation is somebody, uh, we all see this, somebody wants to be a big whack surgeon. That's a term we use kind of oddly, but, and they're not a big whack surgeon. And you can see some real problems and some real struggles when people cannot uh, kind of align who they are with what they want to be. And being present is the challenge of and the reward of answering this question. So how do we get there? Well, this is one analogy from sports. This is the winningest high school rugby coach in history. I don't know, that 
counts as much about being section chief at, at Presbyterian Hospital in West Philadelphia. But uh, he had a, a mantra for his team, and it was win, which means what's important now, not what happened five minutes ago, not what needs to happen in the next 10 minutes to win the game. But in this very moment, what do you need to do? And that mentality led his team to multiple, multiple, multiple national championships and a winning percentage well above 90 percent. This is our favorite fictional sports coach, right? And that's why living in the moment is a present. And there's lots of lessons from nature, right? Anybody who has a pet, particularly dogs, are incredibly present beings, right? When it's time to eat, it's time to eat. When it's time to greet you, it's time to greet you. When it's time to play fetch, it's time to play fetch. That's what they're focused on. And, and this was Sam, who unfortunately uh, uh, passed during COVID, but was an incredibly present and mindful being in retrospect and helped me understand that. And that's the, the lesson in nature. No bird sits around looking to see if another bird's getting more attention or notice. They sing their song innately. And that's our challenge is finding our song and singing it. And the other great uh, lesson for, for purpose and, and presence is work-life balance. And I hate the analogy of the scale. One goes up, the other has to go down. We are so much more complex than work and uh, life. There's so much that goes into who we are as a being and so many of you know, I've gotten into yoga and I think now work like balance, like a complex yoga pose, pushes and pulls, pain and discomfort, as well as joy. Um, and it's putting it all together and, and making it work. And this is a great model. This is from Stuart Friedman, who's actually at Penn. And this is what most of our lives look like. Work takes up a huge chunk of it, home and self, smaller parts and communities often out there on the side. But Dr. Friedman makes the argument, the more we can align these things, the more we can bring them together, we can decrease psychological stress, we can increase discretional energy and harmony. And that's what I'm doing with you today. I've just aligned community, self, home and work by talking with you and the, the uh, joy it brings me and the, the satisfaction is tremendous. And so if we put our energy in one purposeful present direction, not only do we get a lot more done, we're not diffusing our energy all around us, but also creates tremendous happiness. And this is a science paper about that. And I've highlighted in yellow kind of some of the very intentional or purposeful in the moment activities measured by this group, working, grooming, self-care, reading, praying, worshiping, meditating, exercising, making love. And when our minds are not wandering, when we are in the moment, that's when we are happiest as human beings. And it brings us to the concept of dharma, which is where passion, expertise, and usefulness meet compassion. This is who we are as surgeons. This is who we are in medicine. That's the easy part. The hard part is cultivating this. So how do we figure this out? Well, where we have skills and passion, work the hardest. This is your favorite thing to do when you're in and out of work. So do them. When you have no skill and no passion, find other people who love those things and honor them for doing them. When you have skills, but no passion, you can try and bring some energy to that. And if it's not happening, outsource again. And when you have no skills and no, but a lot of passion, these are your hobbies. And for me, I love basketball. Unfortunately, the Sixers still aren't calling now that I moved to a bigger <laughs> city, but it's what I enjoy doing. And it brings us to the same concept of periodization. We can do the same thing, but also thinking about this as our identity and who we are is a great way to build change. And there's neuroscience to back this up. Once again, moving things from our neocortex front brain to our innate brain, that system two to system one, helps us become a uh, helps it become more innate. So instead of identifying yourself as a uh, say, oh, I want to be a healthy person, ask the question: How would a healthy person react in this situation? How would they eat? How would they exercise? What kind of response would they have? And then sometimes the answer becomes easier. And our institutions can support us, and we can support our institutions in this. Really important quick plug for kind of building, choosing and building the institution around yourself. And the last thing we'll talk about briefly before we get into complications and such is being non judgmental and how do we cultivate kindness? So, this is a common morning commute for a lot of people. Uh, we get upset and we get angry. Uh, why did that person cut me off? Or if you ride public transportation, there's a variety of ways that this can happen. But it's also easy to give that person a gracious excuse. They may have been driving like a jerk because they're a jerk, or they may have been driving like a jerk because maybe they had truly an, a medical emergency and we can let things go. And so being kind to others, creating gracious excuses, that's easy. The hard part is putting that on ourselves. So how do we generate that kindness and that non-judgmental state for ourselves? Well, the first is 
not thinking about excuses, right? We can come up with a million excuses. The, the classic ones in yoga, I'm not flexible. I don't have the right body. I don't have time. Those are all the right reasons to do yoga. It'll improve your flexibility. It'll change your body and it'll create more time and space for you. So you have, just as you had a million choices before this moment, you've got a million choices after this moment and you can take it in any direction you want. So excuses don't help you. And for the trainees in the room, we always go, how am I supposed to do this? I'm at everybody else's whim. This is really challenging. Well, focus on your basic needs. Eat well, sleep well, make sure you feel safe at home. And the other things will come. You'll never get to the things, what, what Maslow here called self-actualization, if you can't take care of your basic needs. So if you have a choice between healthy food and McDonald's, choose the healthy foods. If you have the choice between a little bit of sleep or a late night, uh, based on Netflix, choose the, choose the night of sleep. It will help. And the same model exists in, in medicine. And so if we want to climb the ladder in medicine to, to achieve the things we want to achieve, and everybody's pyramid is going to look different, you got to focus on the bottom. And this is one of my favorite analogies. It's about surfing, but we're going to use surgery instead of surfing. Arduous sport, highly technical, highly fun, which no one does involuntarily. But the best surfers and the best surgeons in the world realize there's no point in wasting energy trying to tame the ocean of waves behind you. Ride the waves, enjoy it, use your skills, use everything you've worked on, and it becomes easier to be in the moment and a little more mindful. Now, Alfred Adler was a contemporary of Freud, and uh, he said life has no meaning, and he didn't mean it that life is meaningless, but inherently life has no meaning, but we can assign meaning to that life by how we contribute to others. And he's most famous for saying, have the courage to be disliked, and it doesn't mean be a jerk. It means that knowing the right thing and knowing the right action and behavior, even if other people don't like it, is still the correct way to behave. And, and that's a way to be non-judgmental and move forward. And if you change, you can change the world around you. So summary here, set intentions, use your goals to achieve them, whether that's technical or professional, be present, work in the moment and be non-judgmental by being kind, give yourself grace, understand who you are uh, and empower change. So I'm going to take one sec, Breathe. If anybody has any questions, chats, anything they want to bring up or talk about, now's a great moment. And otherwise, we will get into kind of complications and when things go less than less than ideal. Good. So either you love it or I'm going way too fast, but we will either way, we'll we'll keep moving on. So back to the graveyard and back to walking through the cemetery. So, and this is why we're here. So now that we have that foundation and things do go bad in surgery, this is part of it. And this is a quote from Marcus Aurelius. It's normal to feel pain in your hands and feet. If you're using your feet as feet and your hands as hands, it's normal to feel the pain of surgery. If you were a surgeon, he didn't say that. I said that, <laughs> but, um, and we've heard this before, right? The only way to avoid complications is to not do surgery. Um, so embrace that. that. That's who we are. And so here's another um, poll for this part of this. When did you last experience a complication? I'll give you a chance. This week, this month, the last six months, or in the last year. Or I don't have complications. <laughs> Yeah, and I love um, when I do this in, in person, I ask people to raise their hands. And by the end of the kind of informal poll, the entire room is raising their hands. Just to show you that this is a shared experience. This is who we are as surgeons, yet it's probably the thing we talk about least in groups. We, we have small sessions about this, right? You, you may say to your friend or your colleague or your, your peer, I had a really rough week or this bad thing happened. But we don't often do this in big rooms and big settings, except at the SUL, we did it last year. But this is really profound. And everybody, this is shared experience among all of us. And there's no reason not, not to address it. So thank you for sharing all of that. And there's this tremendous parable from, from Buddhism. It says there, there are two arrows. And the first one hurts. And if we allow ourselves to be struck by the second one, that is more painful. And the second one is the response to the first. It's how we respond to that first arrow. 
You can't control the first one, but you certainly can control the second one. And so we're going to talk through four parts of managing complications or, or mindfully managing complications. And the first is managing the emotional response. So complications bring up a whole bunch of questions. Who did this happen to? What just happened? And it causes pain. It causes pain to a lot of people. So here's the goodwill hunting moment. It, it's not your fault. This is part of who we are. This is part of our shared experience as surgeons. And there's biology to explain this. And there's the biopsychosocial model of well-being, which is exactly what it says. We have biology, we have psychology, and we have social constructs. But the bottom line is that complications and well-being are tied to each other and they are cyclical. And if we allow them to influence each other, it can cause a terrible downward spiral. So how does this happen? Well, the first is the first thing you have to understand is that emotions are completely natural. This was part of evolution. This is how we were designed to stay safe. When we experienced something bad, it caused a tremendous reaction so that we didn't go eat those bad berries or we ran away from the saber-toothed tiger or whatever it may be. Emotions are natural. It's part of our safety mechanism. But the physiology of emotions only lasts 90 seconds. Our body clears catecholamines, clears adrenaline, clears everything within 90 seconds. So the only reason things persist beyond 90 seconds is because we give them meaning. We give them additional time, which is not totally inappropriate. And this goes back to ancient times before we understood the biology. And this is from the Stoics who said, it's not enough to be hit or insulted to be harmed. You must believe that you are being harmed. Your mind is complicit in this provocation. So we assign more to the emotional response than just that response. And this is a model of PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can see how the brain mechanisms can affect our entire body. And if you look at the left side of your screen, these are a lot of the symptoms that, that we experience or we note in burnout. And burnout and PTSD are not the same. And, and that's not why I do that. But it shows you that these the, there are natural physiologic mechanisms behind this. And sometimes by understanding that this is biology and why this happens, it helps us move beyond them and helps us control the biology because we know that is controllable. And now this has a name. This is called second victim syndrome. It has to do with the psychological, cognitive, and physical reactions that all lead to a personal negative impact. And this was put forward by Albert Wu, who's a phenomenal guy at Hopkins and, and here's the quote from the original paper. Virtually everyone knows the sickening realization of making a bad mistake. You feel singled out and exposed. You agonize about it, and it plays over and over again in your mind. And there's a bad cycle that happens or can happen with lack of support, greater risk of burnout and depression. It can lead us to more mistakes and more complications. So really important to understand this process and break this cycle. And I would say beyond the second victim, there's more right? We now know not only does this affect the patient and the surgeon, but that patient's family, it affects our trainees in profound ways that we don't talk about, or we, we, we used to not talk about. We talk about a lot more in our institution now. It affects our support staff, our nurses and techs in the operating room who see these things happen and experience them as well. And ultimately it can affect our hospital. So it's not just a second victim. There are tertiary and quaternary ripples from these events that are really important to understand. And there's something called the Mohawk of self-awareness. And this is once again, a PTS correlate, but trauma takes the frontal cortex and brings it back to our, our limbic brain. But we can turn on these circuits through awareness and give ourselves a better chance of handling these situations. So how do we control emotions? Name the emotion is the first thing or the stress or the complication, call it out, write it down, talk about it. Understand that this is physiology, and within 90 seconds, the physiology is going to pass. So the first thing when something bad happens in the operating room, often, let's say we've got bleeding on the cave, put a lap head on it, control your physiology, control the physiology of people around you. We all want to, we've just got a surge of adrenaline, we want to move faster, slow down, give it a second, let those things pass. And then think about the moment, own that moment, be in that situation and work to bet and work to get better. So how do we do that? One of the ways to practice that there's lots of ways to do it, but mindfulness meditation is one of them. And can, you can think of it as mental conditioning, a way to enhance your mental and cognitive performance. These are some of the touted benefits of meditation, uh, of meditation. And I've highlighted the ones that are specifically uh, applicable to surgery, happiness, anxiety, depression, stress, the ability to introspect, 
emotional intelligence, and resilience. And the principles of mindfulness, it's, we can systematically regulate our attention. We can be in the moment. We can transform the quality of an experience, do it in the service of others and in relationships, not only to our patients, but the people around us. This is exactly who we want to be uh, in surgeons, and this is a mindful approach to complications. So there's lots of support for mindfulness, the AMA. Uh, there are systematic reviews. You can improve your, your uh, patient ratings. Um, all by mindfulness-based practices, and you can decide what that means to you, and you can decide what mindfulness means. And if you're interested in meditation, down on the bottom right, How to Train Your Mind, really short, um, free book on Audible, uh, which is a great way to think about meditation and how to get started. If you're not into meditation, there's lots of other ways to be mindful. Long walks, running, physical activity, particularly cardiovascular activity are all ways to be in the moment and mindful. And once again, this is Dr. Labaris's work that showed how mindfulness can improve performance, well-being, decrease the risk of complications. And lastly, I'll say the military's got this figured out. This is part of uh, army training now. And one of the things they do for, for officers before they do co challenging cognitive training, put them through ridiculous cardiovascular work. And the reason is that's a great way to simulate a stressful situation. Heart rate goes up, breathing goes up, pulse goes up. Now make your decisions when all of those things are elevated. So, so this is not just uh, this is not just uh, me talking here um, in kind of a, a hippy dippy way. So, part two. Now we've dealt with the emotion. How do we critically assess without judgment? So we can learn from the things that cause us problems, and that's a. a a basic uh, principle of, of Buddhism and mindfulness. And it brings up the concept of karma. And people erroneously think that karma means if you put out good energy, good energy comes back, bad energy, uh, and bad energy comes back. It basically means by putting things out in the universe, there are unintended consequences. And I would say if you focus on hurt, you will continue to suffer. And if you focus on the lesson, you will continue to grow. That is one of the basic lessons of karma. And the concept we want to get to here is detachment. And this is not... Um, uh, psychopathic detachment that complications don't affect us. This is detaching and stepping back, trying to observe as an objective person. So we're pretty good at some of this. We can name what happens. We can think about how from personal, systemic, and interpersonal. And the whole point is, how do we prevent this from happening again? So we really have to think about how it happened in the first place. So let's just think about nuts and bolts. Let's get into the personal stuff. First, how do mistakes happen? Well, they're either judgment mistakes or technical. The vast majority are judgment. More is missed by not looking than by not knowing. So in surgery, visual mistakes, misperception, misinterpretation, misprioritization. We either didn't see something or we saw it and interpreted it the wrong way. We thought about something wrong. We had a limited belief, false assumption, or we were closed-minded. Or lastly, the troubling ones, the gremlins, the lack of confidence, that inner critic, or sometimes we truly do lack skills, or we have a technical limitation. Maybe we just haven't been trained yet, or we don't know how to do something. These are all reasons mistakes happen. So how do we approach this systemically? Well, we're really good about this. Context and external forces. We've learned this from the airline industry. If you look at airline crashes, right? Minor technical malfunctions, bad weather, tired pilot, poor communication, and hierarchy. Airline industry broke those things down, improved communication, sleep regulations, break down the hierarchy. Anybody can speak. Airline industry is much more safe. This is now our m, &M right? This is our quality assurance conferences where we talk about things like just society, safe working environments, and we purposefully neglect the personal. But what I would say is that's a mistake. Interpersonal is a huge part of how, thing, how bad things happen and how we get better. So I'm going to take a quick detour into disruptive behaviors. And if anybody's interested in this really fun book called The Schmuck in My Office, who is written by a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist, uh, uh, Jody Foster, I put her picture here so you know she's not the actress, is a psychiatrist at Penn. She's a phenomenal person. She's also the Eagles uh, team psychiatrist. So she, she knows some difficult people. And what's really important, a couple take-homes from this, is the book initially said 60%, but now the data says 80% of disruptive physicians will actually eliminate that bad behavior once you point it out. So the first part of this is just you got to talk to people about it. Nobody wants to be disruptive. And the basics of disruptive behaviors, to know that they violate the rights or disrupt societal norms, they are patterns that exist in and out of work. So when somebody's different at work than they are at home, that's not really – that's slightly different. 
And these are based on personality types, not personality disorders, but pe most people aren't trying to be difficult. It's just kind of who they are. When you have a strong reaction, it indicates that it's time to have an honest and thoughtful intervention and recognize behaviors can change. I'll put a big question mark if people can change, but behavior certainly can change. And it's our responsibility to create an environment where those changes can happen. We can't make somebody else change, but we can create an environment where they can. And common personality types we see in surgery, everybody knows that narcissistic surgeon, this is not narcissistic personality disorder, but this is often a flagr flag flagrantly arrogant person who's really fragile on the inside. And it explains a lot of their behavior. And once you understand that, they become easier to deal with. We know this is what Jody called the bean counters. These are the OCD-like people. And understanding that if we can maintain their control and give them control of a situation, it can often lower that anxiety and make them more effective members of our team. And the robotic. These are people who may officially or unofficially be on the autism spectrum and have difficulty communicating, but at their core really want to communicate. So reaching out to them and helping explain behaviors and, and communication is what we should be doing to help these people along. Uh, and in addition to just the bad behaviors, we all have our own personality, and it's important to understand how we are. I'll show you one of the personality systems. This is called the Enneagram. I like this one a lot, but there's the Myers-Briggs. There's other ways to assess your personality. I like this one because it describes who you are and how you interact with other peoples, and I'm what's called a 3-8, an achieving challenger, which anybody who knows me is exactly who I am. Um, but it also explains who I work well with and who I don't work well with, which helps me understand how to work better in teams and groups. And this goes back to the basics or, the, or the, the basis for the caste system, which says that we cannot exist without all types of people. But where this gets wrong is that it provides rank to each of these roles. And we see this in the hospital. You can't do your surgery unless that operating room assistant cleans the room. Uh, you can't take care of people in clinic unless there's a nurse to room them and take their vitals. And you, we are not better than anyone else. We work together as a team with equal value, no matter what our role is. We do need rank in medicine for safety and making decisions, but not in terms of importance. And this actually uh, plays out in some other literature and surgeons with the highest complication rates are unwilling to be constructive and they lack passive styles. They're too aggressive and they will have the highest complication rooms based on data from University of Michigan. The last part of this is energy and what we bring. So there's something called mirror neurons. We reflect the people around us naturally. So by thinking of a happy situation, the parts of your brain that concede happiness fire. And so we can either bring catabolic break energy that breaks down others around us, or we can build the others around us with our energy. And this is Jack Welch, who is not a great, uh, necessarily a great person, but uh, quoted with uh, most notably quoted by saying, fire your worst 10% of the workforce annually and your workforce will get better. That is true, but doesn't make you very well liked. But he had, he created this two by two table. And when you have high performance and high values, right, good energy, good personality, um, praise and raise those people. Easy to fire the people who have low uh, performance and values. The challenge is in the people, sorry, I'm freezing here. Challenges in the people who perform well, but have low values, you need to remediate or get rid of those people. It's not worth keeping them around because they will bring everyone else down around them. And the people who perform poorly, but have high values, these are the people we coach and we make better. We can give them the skills to perform better. So embrace your mistakes and learn, allow kindness and compassion. And the whole goal is to do your job better. Military is great at this. And one more military analogy. This is the after action review, which is done by the Navy SEALs. So anytime they have a mission, they get in a room afterwards, what was supposed to happen, what happened, what were the differences, what worked, what didn't, and why, and what would you do differently? And the concept here is extreme ownership. And these meetings can get really heated and really personal. But the great analogy I give is a, a mission could fail before, it, uh, say you've got a helicopter mission and fails before it ever gets off the ground because of bad weather. Well, you could just say it was the bad weather. That's why we didn't get to do the mission. Or you could say, well, we could have checked a different weather service. We could have planned better for a different time during the week and take extreme ownership. And we had, the analogy holds true in surgery all the time. It was the patient. It was their comorbidities. It was the disease biology. Yeah, maybe we couldn't have done anything different in that moment, but the next moment we can and we need to take stock. So we do this now as a group. 
um, residents, trainees, PAs, when we have a bad complication, we sit in the room, we first talk about the emotional response, get it out on the table, how it made you feel. And then we talk about ways to get better. And I'm happy to talk more concrete details if anybody wants to know. The waves. The first is understanding the waves are coming. So be, be willing to ride them. Second part is to ride the waves. You need to take care of yourself before you can take care of the patients. It gets back to Maslow. Um, but it also gets back to our plane analogy, right? You put on the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on others. So you need to take care of yourself when you're struggling, when you have complications, make sure that you are eating and sleeping. You're not drinking too much. You're not doing things that can deteriorate because it can make it harder uh, to get better through this. And remember that resilience can be grown, but it's about, in, first of all, it's about engagement, not withdrawal. So we talked about engagement a little bit engaging the emotions, but we also need to engage the patients, our families, the staff, our trainees, stakeholders, people in the hospital, run towards these things rather than away with them because the whole point is getting to the truth. That's how we get better. The last part is this is a community activity. One more, one great sports analogy. We've seen this the last couple of weeks in Buffalo, tremendous tragedy in that city between the, the blizzard and deaths and then DeMar, uh, DeMar's, uh, um, you know, a cardiac arrest on the field. And that city and that community has come together as a group. And so surgery is a team sport and complications are a team experience. So run towards each other, engage each other, not away. And when we think about resilience, another great Buddhist kind of analogy is when faced with challenging, which is the boiling water, you can either become soft like a potato, hard like an egg, or you can change the water like coffee beans and decide how you want to do that. And there are lots of ways to be resilient. These are the ones that are related to mindfulness, optimism, facing fear, spirituality, physical fit, physical and brain fitness, cognitive and emotional flexibility. And the last is a sense of meaning or purpose. And so there's lots of ways to perceive struggle. People talk about growth mindset where there are opportun opportunities, not negatives. A anybody who knows Angie Smith, she helps me a lot with reframing when I have uh, bad things going on. Well, this is, you don't have to, do something, you get to do something that's challenging, or you get to put this in a, in a better light than it is. But if anybody uh, has not read v Victor Frankl's book, I think this is essential to being a human being. The first half of the book is his experience in uh, concentration camps of World War II, and the second half is his um, psychiatric theory, which is evolution from Freud. And the takeaway is that everything can be taken from a man, but the ability to choose is yours. You can't control the circumstances around you, but you can change how you react to them. So how do we handle our complications in a mindful way? First, own the emotions, be present, assess the system, detach, be objective. Think about kindness and compassion in our interpersonal uh, reactions and ultimately build resilience through truth. So I will summarize here. And then we've got about 10 minutes to, to talk. A mindful approach to surgery can enhance many or all of our aspects of a surgical existence and by being intentional, present, and non-judgmental. This can help us with a healthy and sustainable surgical career. Bad things are going to happen. We can control how, they, how we react to them. We can't necessarily control the things around it. Understand how your personality and energy affect those around you and engage with the people around you, engage with the, with the context and the situation to prevent the next bad thing from happening. So um, thank you very much. I'm happy to talk in person now. Feel free to reach out to me because I couldn't be there in person, email, social media, any of it is okay. I'll send you my cell phone if you want. Um, I'm always willing and, and happy to talk about these things. So um, there's your obligatory CME slide. I'll leave that up for a few seconds. And uh, I see one uh, Q&A. Yeah, so two, two questions I see popped up. Um, first is I like the concept of not asking, but how did this happen? Uh, but rather, how did I let this happen? Right. And, th and that's the extreme ownership. And that's really hard. And I will tell you personally, um, I'm not a quick processor. So sometimes it takes me days to really figure this out and be honest with myself. And those couple of days can really hurt uh, when you have a bad complication or something bad happen. And um, part of it is talking to other people and asking them, what did you think about this? What could we have done better there? But yeah, that's the really important question. And, and that's a challenge. 
And uh, Michelle asked, can you elaborate more on how you incorporated this into your department m and Yeah, so uh, let me be clear. Our department m and is the same. It's objective, it's protected, um, quality assurance conference, whatever you want to call it. The um, What we've done is when we've had some really bad complications, and I'll give you one specific example. Um, we had an elderly patient who had a really bad upper tract urothelial cancer, someone in their late 80s. And we knew surgery was going to be hard. Or, or not surgery was going to be hard. We, surgery was going to be easy. We knew recovery was going to be challenging. So we loaded the boat, uh, geriatrics, palliative care. Everybody was involved in kind of the preoperative assessments. But we knew that she had longer than a 12 to 18 month life expectancy. And uh, we made the decision with her and her family to go forward with surgery. Surgery went without a hitch. But as you can imagine, the recovery didn't. And she had some nausea and vomiting. She had, uh, but she was tolerating food. She was passing gas. And we all thought she was getting better. We left her on, I'll never forget it, on Monday night. And we got called a few hours later. She basically had a massive aspiration event when she vomited again. And she went to the ICU. And as you can imagine, she didn't make it. And we hit my entire team from my outpatient team to the inpatient team had got to know and love this patient because we had so many interactions with her and she was just a tremendous human being. And this one really, really, really hurt. So we sat down in a room for about 45 minutes. Everybody who touched that patient, myself, uh, our residents, our PAs, the uh, inpatient nursing team, particularly the nurse who um, found her and, and called the code. ICU team was invited. They didn't, they did decline. They didn't come, um, uh, which was totally appropriate. And so we sat down in a room and the first thing I said was, um, I, I expressed one of my biggest fears is that I am an optimist by nature and I had rose colored glasses on and I missed something in her because I thought she was getting better. And that just opened the floodgates and everybody kind of shared their emotions, good or bad. And uh, before we started that conversation, we made it very clear that the conversation in the room stayed in the room. And it evolved and it went from the emotion and getting all of that out and some tears, some of my tears, um, into what we have done better and what we decided. And we now have an institutional policy in my hospital when we have a geriatric patient, as soon as they are in the hospital more than two days, geriatrics, um, potentially palliative care based on their, on their cancer gets involved as an inpatient to make sure we are managing these people uh, totally appropriately. If they're having a renal issue, nephrology gets on board. We now bring all the consultants in earlier than we ever would to make sure we load the boat and try and prevent uh, bad things from, from happening. So I hope that I hope that answers that question. And then uh, Avi asked, uh, do you have a book or reading list you would share? Um, I meant to put it at the end of this talk, Avi. Um, I, I knew somebody was going to ask. Um, email me or get my contact information. I'll send anybody who wants it, or I can send it to your um, your crew for dispersion. There's some great books um, out there uh, about mindfulness, about performance based enhancement. I kind of break them down so you can think about what resonates with you. And I'll kind of give you um, my brief ones. If you really want to think about mindfulness and kind of Buddhist approaches to medicine, the um, think like a monk is a great way to start. If you're more interested in performance and just kind of elite performance, I would start with peak performance. And interestingly, those two books have exactly the same conclusions. They just arrive at them at very different kind of uh, directions. Um, there's now a new book called uh, art of being grounded or something like that by Brad Schulberger, who's one of the peak performance authors, great book for kind of combining those things. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely send it out if anybody has any questions or, uh, or wants to hear more about that. And this talk I think is recorded. I'm happy to share the slides. There's lots of books kind of labeled throughout it. I try to put them in the bottom corners so you guys can, can see them. Good. Let me take down the share because you guys have had enough of the CME. Dr. Carroll, your hand's up. Phil, so thank you very much. I think this is a great, uh, a great presentation, and we appreciate it. And um, I've read most of the, the books that you mentioned there, and, and I may add to the list a few, a few others. I think the one thing I might comment on, you, you mentioned it early on, and, and I call it kind of the Twitter handle where you list your priorities. And I, and I found over the time, and my priorities are very similar to yours, uh, but I, when I found some very unhappy physicians or those who 
uh, silo the priorities. And, and we have to realize that our priorities can change on any given moment. So yes, we're all family people, but you get called in the middle of the night about a patient, and I can't tell you the number of holidays when I've been in the operating room rather than having dinner with my family. And, and I think when physicians sometimes silo their, uh, their the, these priorities, they, they're the most unhappy. When they say, I can only be a family person or I can be a physician, I can't be both at one time. And I always tell people, I think I'm a better father because I think I'm a very good physician or I aspire to be and, and, and just the, the, the opposite. The other thing I liked uh, very much um, was your thing about when you went over how complications happen. And I think you had it there. I think you had it, but one I always point out is preparation. And, and, and we see that that's com you know, missing the positive urine culture, you know, the, the, the preparation. And I, I tell people that your, your habits should reflect your values. So that means your day-to-day -day habits should reflect your values and, and, and be uh, sure about that. Uh, I also very much liked your idea about, uh, and I, I learned transcendental meditation, I think before many people on this people were born, okay? So I have my, I have my, my mantra and, and uh, I perhaps don't use it as, as, as much as I should, but as you mentioned, there are, there are a lot of different ways to, to practice mindfulness. Uh, my meditation has been supplanted by my 515 early morning uh, my morning runs and during my runs, my mind, my mind does wander. So I, you had to think about wandering minds are no good, but I actually, I find that that wandering mind is sometimes the, the greatest source of my creativity when you're not being barraged by emails, by, by, um, by pages. Uh, and I find that wandering mind actually is, is, is very relaxing for me where I see my mind drifting. And sometimes it lands on some of my most creative, uh, creative thoughts. Um, I, I like your idea of reading lists. I, I, I would invite all faculty to kind of let's add to that uh, because I think um, many of the, the, the titles that you quoted there are, are really important ones. Uh, but this, this is an excellent, excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. And, and I think the most important thing is reflecting on these things just as, as you have done. And um, I'll just make a couple uh, quick comments back. And I think you're absolutely right about the siloed problem that gets to that identity confusion. And the one way you can see it is how you interpret that. The reason you went in on the holidays is because you're a good family man and you were setting the proper example for your family on how you take care of people and how you take care of others around you. Um, and one thing we can do institutionally, and we all have our, our, our feelings on this, but Right. Depending on the complication, depending on the issue, one of our partners can also step in and help help us out um, if they're on call. And that's one of the ways as a group uh, that you can decide to kind of cover for each other and preserve those values and those identities. Um, so that that is an option. It doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for every institution, but it is one of the ways to think about it. And um, I would say I, I love what you said, too, about the mindfulness and the mind wandering. There's a, another talk I give about kind of how to... Um, maximize your brain uh, output. And that's actually one of our brain processes that we don't allow to work. We're, we're very linear thinkers when we're cognitively kind of plugged in, but our brain has this kind of parallel processor too that lumps things together. And um, that's one of my thing, favorite things about my meditation practice is the first five, six, seven minutes where I can't get my mind quiet. Some amazing connections happen uh, as that's happening. And then eventually you can get to a spot where things kind of quiet down, but you're right. Um, and, and the key is not running away from that fluttering brain. That's incredibly powerful. And that's how we get some of our best thinking done. So embrace it and allow it to do what it needs to do. So yeah, oh, wonderful points. The, the other uh, thing, Philip, that I always mention that one of the most isolating events is uh, when these take on a medical legal perspective. And I think that's when physicians and caregivers feel the most isolated, the most vulnerable, and which do, creates the highest burden on the individual and their family. And I don't think the medical system uh, adequately supports physicians during these kinds of events. Uh, and and um, I think preparing, uh, you, you've seen the data on, on uh, if you go into a certain specialty, how, how likely you will be uh, undergo uh, being sued over your career. It's very high, but those, those are very isolating events. And, and um, I, I don't know how you prepare your, prepare your trainees for those, but I think that's something that has not been adequately addressed by the the, the uh, medical group. Yeah, it's a great point because you're right. As soon as you bring somebody else in that conversation, 
now they they can become part of that legal conversation. So um, I've thought about this a little bit, haven't had the experience, but um, potentially you could bring a lawyer in the room and just have a lawyer sit, have a hospital lawyer sit there while, while you hash some of these things out and that protects it. It becomes a protected conversation. So. Yeah, I think one more question popped up, but I want to be respectful of time. So, so Tom or, or Marshall, please cut me off. Um, I'm happy to share the presentation. And then somebody asked about extreme ownership and one's um, mental health and well-being. Yeah, it's a it's a great point, but I think it it's all tied to each other. And the part of being it, having extreme ownership is being in the moment, and and I think getting to the truth will reduce a lot of the the anxiety and the dissonance and the pain you feel from these things. And it's hard and it's challenging, but give it a, a try. It's going to work differently for different people. And um, you may experience different than, than others. So uh, you lose nothing by trying. Well, it's about eight o'clock now, Philip. We all love this talk. And uh, I think the, the dialogue will continue after this talk. And uh, we look forward to that here. And as you said, if you don't have a complication, you're probably not doing surgery. And, uh, uh, that brings us to our core uh, and uh, has a big impact on all of us. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, Philip.